Hey, Calvary, it is great to see you today. Glad that you have joined us uh, in your homes, in your living rooms, uh, maybe watching on your phone or your TV. We're just glad that, that you've gathered with us to worship Jesus and to celebrate the life that God has given us, even during these difficult times. Uh, and let me just uh, say, uh, we're praying for you. We want to encourage you and help you in any way we can. So if you have any needs, uh, let us know. If you have any prayer requests, let us know. We'd be glad uh, to help any way that we can. And if you're a guest that uh, is visiting with us today from your living room or from uh, your uh, house, uh, work, wherever you are tuning in, uh, we're just glad that you're with us. And if you've got any questions that, that you have after the sermon, uh, after this time together, please contact us uh, by phone or by email. We'd love to set up a time that we could talk with you and share with you and help you on your faith journey. Hey, let me uh, encourage you, wherever you are, to grab your Bible or your Bible app and turn to the Gospel of Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15 is going to be our text today. And, and if you turn there, you'll be able to follow along. And it occurred to me that it's now been three weeks that we've been practicing this social distancing, trying to uh, uh, flatten the curve on the spread of the coronavirus. And many of us embraced the social distancing kind of at different speeds. I mean, some of you were early adopters, and right away you're like, yep, we got to shut down everything, we got to stay home. Uh, some of us kind of adapted a little bit, you know, uh, along the way. And some were kind of forced into it, you know, uh, as things happen and you're social distancing and, and still grumbling about it, frustrated by it. But what did it take for you to embrace social distancing? What was it that got your attention that kind of changed your world as you know it? Was it when they closed the schools? Was it when the, you know, President Trump announced that uh, we need to shut down for 15 days? Was it, uh, you know, when they canceled your trip or your conference? Or when they shut Disneyland, did that get your attention? Or, or was it when you started having to work from home uh, in your business or, or you got laid off because they shut down your business? Was it when uh, they, they shut down the restaurants? Did that get your attention? Or was it the fact that we can't gather to worship as the church in one place? Because, you know, that kind of ripped my heart out. I'll just be honest about that. Uh, maybe it's when you discovered that your life group members uh, were staying home because they had underlying health issues, that it became real to you. Or, or maybe it was when you saw that the death toll in the United States started going up. Or maybe it's, you know, when they reported we have cases here in Lake Havasu City and Parker in our communities. But what did it take for you to embrace that social distancing? Uh, today we're continuing our Unlikely Witnesses study. We're, we're leading up to Easter. And, and Easter was an event of radical change, of turmoil, upheaval, where everything was uncertain and unknown and different. Kind of like the world we're living in today. Uh, and so today I want to ask you a question. And this is a question I hope you wrestle with all week. Just, just really, this is one that uh, maybe you'll talk about uh, together as a family, but I know that I want each of you to wrestle with this with God. And that is, what will it take for you to believe? What will it take for you to believe? What will it take for you to finally and completely believe in Jesus, to to confess Jesus as Lord, to, to place your faith and trust in Him for the first time, to say, hey, you know what? I'm going to be a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm going to admit that I believe He's the Son of God, Savior of the world, that He died on the cross to pay for my sins and was raised from the dead, and I'm going to follow Jesus with my life from this point forward. What's it going to take? Because we want you to know that your sins are forgiven. We want you to know that heaven is your destiny. We, we want you to, to know that God loves you and God can redeem your life no matter what you're going through, even the circumstances of today. So what will it take for you to believe? Or maybe you say, hey, I already believe in Jesus. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. If that's the case, then what's it going to take for you to really follow Jesus with your life? You know, with not letting anything else get in the way, just wholeheartedly committing to follow Jesus in every aspect of your life. So what's it going to take for you to forgive those who've really wronged you, who've really hurt you, who've broken your life apart? Whether they ask for forgiveness or not, what's it going to take for you to forgive them? What's it going to take for you to treat everyone with kindness, even if they're not kind to you? 
even if they just grab the last pack of toilet paper or the last pound of ground beef in the store? What's it going to take for you to be faithful to your spouse? Physically, emotionally, uh, spiritually, mentally. What's it going to take for you to give as God challenges or to serve as Jesus modeled? What is it going to take? Or what's it going to take for you to finally believe that you are fearfully and wonderfully made? That, That God really does delight in you and that you are loved and valued by God Almighty? What's it going to take to convince you that you are significant, that you have purpose, that you matter to the kingdom of God? What's it going to take for you to believe that God can redeem you, your circumstances, your life, no matter what? What's it going to take for you to believe? Uh, Today we're looking at an unexpected witness. He was transformed from a critic to a confessor. In fact, it even surprised him that he made the change. Uh, Scripture does not tell us his name. It defines him by his occupation and his position. He was a Roman soldier, and he was in charge of other soldiers. He was what the Scriptures call a centurion. Mark chapter 15 has uh, this part of the story. Now, understand, Mark 15 has a story of the uh, trial of Jesus, the crucifixion of Jesus. That's already taken place. This is while Jesus is on the cross. We're going to pick up in verse 33. If you have a heading like mine, it's going to say the death of Jesus. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, hey, he's calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to Jesus to drink, saying, let's wait and see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry, and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing Jesus saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the Son of God. Truly this man was the Son of God. This is an amazing change in a man who's been hardened by battle and by duty and by death. You see, the centurion went from an executioner to confessing Jesus. I mean, the centurion is enmeshed in the arrest and the trial and the crucifixion story. Uh, Now, centurion means he's in charge of 100 men. So he's a commander. And and, uh, let me just give you a little bit of background. Jesus was arrested by the temple guards. You know, uh, Judas Iscariot betrayed Jesus in in the garden while he was praying. And the temple guards of the high priest arrested Jesus and took him to the high priest. And there he was put on trial, he was beaten, he was mocked, he was uh, convicted of blasphemy. And they took him to Pontius Pilate, who's the Roman governor, and handed him over to them. And uh, they said, we want you to put Jesus to death. And that's when the centurion came into play, because his soldiers took Jesus into custody. And he was there throughout the trial uh, and all that took place. And so uh, he was there when Jesus was condemned. He was there when Jesus was beaten. He was there when, uh, when the crucifixion was ordered and he saw it out. So just follow with me what, what this centurion participated in on what we call Good Friday. Uh, so we know that the centurion mocked Jesus. He mocked Jesus. If you'll turn back one page in your Bible, uh, if you got one like mine anyway, it might be in the same page in your, uh, on your device, it says in verse 16 of Matthew, or excuse me, Mark 15, it says, And the soldiers led Jesus away inside the palace, that is the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole battalion. And they clothed Jesus in a purple robe, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put, him, put it on him. And they began to salute him and mock him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put on his clothes, and they led him out to crucify Jesus. Now, the centurion probably watched his men make sport of Jesus. 
They, they, they probably, he probably approved of what they were doing because they wouldn't have done it without his permission. They would have looked to him and said, can we do this? So he either participated or he approved of them and watched them. So he mocked Jesus, and then this same centurion tortured Jesus. In the Gospel of John, chapter 19, uh, John describes how Pilate had Jesus flogged, which means they tied Jesus to a post, and then they took a whip, and it had bits of iron and bone uh, glued to it, sewn into it, and, and then they would hit it to strike Jesus repeatedly. And, and they did this uh, uh, basically to torment him, to torture him, uh, and Pilate had done it to, to hopefully just beat Jesus bloody and then present him and say, Can, is this good enough uh, to the Jewish leaders, and of course it wasn't. They demanded he be crucified. But the centurion was part of that. He oversaw that detail while Jesus was literally tortured and had his flesh uh, ripped apart by this whip. And then the centurion crucified Jesus. Crucified. He was in charge of the crucifixion detail. Uh, All the Gospels describe the crucifixion. Jesus was nailed to a cross, The cross was raised off the ground, uh, and he was exposed, he was humiliated, he was beaten, he was bloody. And there on the cross, which is a torturous way to die, uh, on the cross you die from suffocation. You literally can't breathe, uh, and uh, and you have to lift your body up using the the nails in your hands and in your feet to, uh, to pull yourself up and try to gasp for breath. The centurion was there. Uh, he was the one who was in charge of making sure that Jesus died that day. And then the centurion witnessed Jesus. He saw this whole thing. He watched the mockery, the torture, the crucifixion. He he saw Jesus' gentleness and self-control and dignity throughout this horrific process. I mean, he, he heard Jesus speak from the cross. He saw the mercy of Jesus when he prayed, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Jesus was praying for the centurion and the soldiers as they literally nailed him to the cross. He he saw the faith of Jesus as he prayed, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He saw the triumph of Jesus when Jesus shouted out, It is finished. You see, the centurion would have been familiar with that because that's a cry of victory on the battlefield. I'm sure that got his attention as he thought, what is finished? He saw the compassion and grace given from Jesus to others while he himself was being tortured on the cross. The Pharisees, the religious leaders came and they mocked Jesus and challenged him that if he really is the Son of God to come off the cross and Jesus was silent. He he listened as Jesus gave hope and grace to a thief who was being crucified with him. While one thief mocked Jesus, the other simply asked Jesus to remember him when he came into his kingdom. And Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. And he observed as Jesus cared for his mother when he asked the apostle John to, to take care of his mom after his death. And because he watched all of this, because he witnessed this firsthand up close, this man who is battle-hardened, who is a leader of men, who is a soldier of Rome, he confessed Jesus. He confessed Jesus. Mark chapter 15, verse 39. The centurion says, Truly this man was the Son of God. He ended up confessing Jesus as Lord. Now, that's what we know. That's what it took for this centurion to believe. What will it take for you to believe? What will it take for you to believe? What will it take for you to confess Jesus as Lord? Now, maybe you've got questions. Maybe you want to have a conversation. Maybe there's some things that don't make sense to you and and you go, well, you know, I I need some questions answered. Then then allow us to answer those questions or at least to try to help you process them. 
Uh, again, you can contact Calvary by phone, by email, set up an appointment. We would be glad to talk with you on the phone, FaceTime you, uh, whatever is necessary so that we can help you come to that place where you can believe. What will it take for you to get baptized? I know there's some of you watching this that believe in Jesus. You know that you're a follower of Jesus Christ. You know your sins are forgiven. You know that heaven is your destiny. But you've never publicly declared your faith in Jesus. And maybe you've convinced yourself it's unimportant, not necessary. But God's calling you to publicly declare your faith in Jesus. And we want to help you do that. Again, you can contact us at the church office. We'll schedule a time for you to get baptized. Even when we can't gather, we can baptize you and, and put it on video so the whole world can see that you're a follower of Jesus Christ. But what's it going to take? What's it going to take for you to follow Jesus the way that He wants you to follow Him? You see, we're in crazy times right now. People are afraid. Some of you are despairing. You're afraid you're going to get sick. You're afraid you're going to lose everything financially. You're afraid of, of what the, is going to happen next. And the truth is, we don't know, but here's what I do know. God is with you. God loves you. He's for you. He wants to bless you. He wants to give you hope and love and forgiveness. He wants to fill your life with joy and peace. What will it take for you to receive that? Because the closer you get to Jesus, the more you surrender to Him, then the more real that's going to be in your life. So what's it going to take for you to believe? Will you pray with me? Father, thank You for loving us. Thank You for giving us grace and mercy through Your Son, Jesus Christ. We know we don't deserve it. We know Jesus died for us giving his life to pay for our sins. And Lord, we thank you for that. We have no hope apart from you, and, and we see your love demonstrated on the cross. And today I pray that you would help us to believe. Father, for those that are wrestling with whether or not they can really trust you to save them, I pray that you would reveal yourself to them and give them that grace needed uh, to take that step of faith. Father, for those who've been holding back and declaring their faith publicly, I pray that you'd fill them with courage and hope right now. Father, for your children that, that love you and know you but have been living in disobedience, I pray that they would hear your voice and, and they would seek you like never before. Father, you're a God who has done everything for us. So today, meet us here and help us to live for you. Help us to believe enough to make a difference in our lives. We love you. We commit ourselves to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In just a moment, we're going to celebrate communion together. In your homes, in the places that you're watching this, I, I hope that uh, you've already gotten some bread or crackers or uh, you know, some, some juice or wine or soda or whatever it is you have that, that you can partake of. And, and pass it out to those who are believers. Communion is, is what believers do to express their faith in Jesus, to remind themselves that Jesus loved them and died for them and, and gave himself up for them. Uh, communion is a time to recommit yourself to following Jesus wholeheartedly. It, it's a time when we confess our sins and we say, God, I, I know that you've already paid for my sins on the cross. Forgive me my sins today because I'm admitting them to you. It's a time to say, Jesus, I'm yours completely. So if you're alone or if you're with your family and our friends, uh, I'm just going to encourage you right now to take the bread, take the cracker, whatever you have. And uh, Jesus said, oh, on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread, he broke it, and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. In the same way, Jesus took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this in remembrance of me. Father, we thank you 
for the grace and the love and the mercy that you have given us in Jesus Christ. Help us to live as people of grace and of love and as mercy to honor our Lord and Savior. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.